time. Think about the last message you heard on manhood and womanhood, right? And think about the theme for it. Okay, this might have been like two weeks ago, might have been five years ago. More than likely, you probably heard manhood and womanhood about roles either um, in marriage, which is probably the most likely one, maybe who on dating if you're in college, um, or about how women can teach. So, when this, when this topic came up about manhood and womanhood, I want to take a, a little different trajectory. Because the reality is, the Bible is a lot more than women can't teach. <laughs> okay? And the Bible is a lot more than you're a, a wife and you're a husband. <clears throat> so, I didn't tell this message today, more than marriage, men and women's roles are more than about family roles. So let's do this. Husband and wife, what else? Okay? Being a man and woman in Christ is more than leading a family and caring for children. When you are born, you are born single. When you will die, one of you will die single. One <laughs> 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 of you will either be a widow or a widower. Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm just being real, dog. Y'all are all old now. Okay, it's not Disney. It's real life. <laughs> so, one of the important things I think we should see from the Bible is how we're called to be men and women in Christ apart from just our family roles. Okay, and the reality is that none, few of us are going to be full-time ministers. Right, that's the reality. So, one of the things I want to, want to talk about tonight is understanding manhood in Christ and how it means more, more than just that you lead and teach in places, more than just in the church and the household. Okay, most of the message you hear about man, manhood is like, well, if you're a pastor, then you do this. Or if you're a husband, then you do this. And I don't want to look around this room, I don't see any pastors, and very few of you are husbands. Okay, so I wanted to talk to frame it in that, in that way. Understanding womanhood in Christ means understanding that you're more than just submissive. You're called to set an example in godliness and love. One thing that really convicted me when I was at uh, Bethel Seminary is uh, Bethel is an egalitarian seminary, right? And so most of the time when we talked about men and women's roles, I disagreed with my professors. Uh, two of my professors actually wrote a statement on men and womanhood for the egalitarian council seminary. And then, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna get this right. I'm gonna get this the biblical, I can't get it right. It's something about accountability. You can Google it later. But my professor asked me, why is it that every time we talk about men and womanhood, we just talk about what women, what women can do? All right. Why is it that every time we talk about women, we just talk about what they can't do? And that really convicted me. <clears throat> so tonight, I want to I want to talk about that. I want to talk about what it means to be a woman, and in a way that's not just about what you can do. All right, and also more than just you being a wife, right? Because the other passage you guys hear all the time is the one in Ephesians 5, wives submit to your husbands. But then if you're single, it's like, okay, so I'm free, <laughs> right? Here's one of my points. Temperament matters, but it is not determinative. Can someone read temperament, that definition for me? <clears throat> the combination of mental, physical, and emotional traits Okay, and I got this from dictionary.com. The reason I put that there is because I think a lot of times when we think about what men and women are, we think about temperament. Okay, we, we think about women being quiet, and as if quiet is like this personality trait that God requires of you. So, for example, if you're born loud, then you're basically so being to God. Or we think about temperament as Guys, you have to be bold and be like Gaston from Beauty and the Beast, or you have to be like, who's that guy from Mulan who sings that song? Let's get down to this. Do you know what that guy's name is? Uh, anyway, that guy. Okay. Yeah, I know what you mean. <clears throat> but I think biblical man and woman is more than just temperament. Right? It's more than just what you are in terms of like your head. Like, are you macho or are you not macho? Right? Are you big and brawny or are you small? Right? Are you skinny? Right? In, in most cultures, like, well, if you're the bigger you are, the fatter you are, the more you are a man. The skinnier you are, the less you are a man. That makes no sense. Okay? Emotionally, is it just because you're caring, you're a woman? Men can't care. <clears throat> or that's to read this position. When we think about men, we think about like, you gotta be violent. Right? That's like the most when people say like, <coughs> your man wanna fight, you know, like when guys challenge them, that's always good because that's you like just do you wanna fight? Okay? <laughs> Natural predisposition, mental, physical, emotional traits does not define who you are. 
one of the things I want to show you guys from scripture is that women can, be, can pioneer, they can be loud, and they can have vision. All right, hopefully, hopefully this will set some women free in this, in this church. I think the Bible affirms women who want to step up in the church. Where being submissive does not necessarily mean that you have to step back and let other people do things. Okay? Being a woman and being submissive does not mean you just step back and watch other people do things and then just like get out of the background. I don't think that's what the Bible calls it to. I can, I can find very few examples of where the Bible calls women to be apathetic. Right? The women who are commended in scripture are active in serving or right? and active in having vision. Sometimes they're loud. Right? Sometimes they're like a judge like of Deborah and they call men out and be like, hey, if you don't want to lead your war, you know, like people who's gonna fight, I'll lead them to fight. Right? Sometimes they take charge. That's just the reality. But at the same time, men can be sensitive, right? The flip side. <clears throat> One of the things that really convicted me was my professor um, was talking to me and he's like, because I'm, I'm complimentary, right? So I'm like, yeah, men should call their leaders. And he challenged me, he's like, well, David, let me ask you this. I've met a lot of, I've come to a lot of men who come to me crying, saying that I can't leave. What should I do? Am I not a man? Right? And I'm young, right? So I've never heard that before. And I was like, what? But I thought about it. It makes sense. Some guys just can't leave. That's just the reality. If you play video games, you know, right? Sometimes like, people get like guilty or something like that, and it's like, man, you're terrible. Even if this is a video game, it doesn't even matter, but I'm like so upset at <laughs> how you're leaving this. <clears throat> so let me propose this. Men can be followers, men can be quiet, and they can be sensitive, and be God honored. Alright? I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you guys some examples from scripture because I believe that scripture doesn't set manhood and womanhood just into this, like, the confines of temperament. Right? And I really believe that. I really believe that a lot of what American church teaches about manhood and womanhood is just about temperament. It's just like, well, women need to be quiet, just wear dresses and wear hats and da da da. Right? And men, you have to, like, play football and, like, do fighting and da da da. Okay? And that's not biblical to me. That seems like we're just promoting a culture, right? And I don't want to promote a culture, I want to promote what the Bible says. So let's go to the first passage. <clears throat> Romans 16. You can you give your own Bible, you can do your own, or follow faith is the NIV. <clears throat> Romans 16. I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at Centria. That you may welcome her in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints, and help her in whatever she may need from you, for she has been a patron of many, and of myself as well. <clears throat> I commend to you our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church at I'm the point of I would say Kentria. 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 <clears throat> Every word in the Bible is meaningful, right? Especially when you think about how they wrote the Bible down centuries ago, right? They had to handwrite every single character in the word. So nothing here is wasted. Think about what Paul says to, to Phoebe. He opens, he opens with, I commend to you. Right? So he opens that, that way, and again, the Bible is eternal, right? So Wikipedia will fade, Encyclopedia like Britannica, and like TMZ and all that's going to fade. What Paul says, what God says about Phoebe is going to be eternal forever. I commend to you our sister Phoebe. And there's scripture for her, right? You can give it scripture. Is she a wife? Is she a mother? Is she invisible? Like, we don't even know who she is. A servant. A servant of the church. <clears throat> Womanhood is more than just being a mother. If Paul wanted to say she's a mother, he could have said she's a mother. If Paul wanted to say she's a good wife, he could have said she's a good wife. From this passage, you don't even know if she's married or not. You don't know if she has kids or not. The way Paul opens is he says, I commend to you, right, our sister Phoebe, a servant of the church. Just so you guys know, Phoebe um, actually is a, is a saint in Roman Catholicism, Anglicanism, Lutheranism, and even Eastern Orthodox. People say about her that she probably carried the, the, some of the epistles of Paul to where they needed to go. Right? She, so she was like a big time, like promoting Paul's writing kind of person. She's a big servant of the church. Paul is asking the church that you may welcome her in, a, in the Lord in a way worthy of the saints. The reality is, is that women's, women have never had seen rights of men, right? You guys know in, in this country, one woman had the right to vote. 
where are 1920. Okay. This 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 country has been around for maybe like you know 150 years before women had a chance to vote. Think about that for a second. All right. Women got the right to vote less than 100 years ago. Less than 100 years ago. Women have never had the same rights as men. It's a moral process to hear. You may welcome her in the, in the Lord in a way that is worthy of the saints. And so, this is to the church. <clears throat> you know, I think sometimes we don't welcome women servants in the church the same way we welcome men. Right? We, we give people titles like pastors, and we're, we're like very scared to give any kind of title to women. We want to call them like children's director, or like <laughs> servant, she's helping out with the youth, or something like that, right? Like, we don't want to give these women titles in the church. We don't want to give them like things of honor in the church. Paul says about Phoebe, though, welcome her in a way that is worthy of the saints. Paul is commending her. She is among the saints. She, you don't put her as a lower class citizen. She's not Barnabas. She's not the Apostle Peter. She's not the Apostle John, but yet you welcome her the same way you would welcome the Apostle John. In a way worthy of the saints. And help her in whatever way, whatever she may need from you. <clears throat> Why does Paul say that? I think you can glance over this and just be like, well, that's nice. She needs help from you and help her out. Is Paul saying here, hey, when she comes by, she needs some food or she needs to stay? Because if that's, that's the case, then why put the Bible? Right? I mean, the Bible is for all eternity. Is it really Paul's worried about rent? I don't think so. Because if, because Paul says what she is, Paul says she's a servant of the church, and she's about to come by. So what is she going to need from you? She's, a, she's probably doing a work of like an apostle, a work of a disciple of Christ, a work of someone who is representing her church. And so she may need from you people to come alongside her and say, hey, we're going to go evangelize to this city. Come with me. Or we're going to, we need funds to build this building. Let's do some fundraising. Or Paul needs to go such and such. Let's help him prepare some of his letters and carry them over. So what that means to me then is that she's a pioneer. What that means to me then is that she has vision, that she's leading something. Right? That Paul and I just were like, oh, this girl, she's so sweet. Just help her pay rent right, when she gets there. What that says to me is that Paul is saying of Phoebe, she's going to come to you, and you might not respect her, right? Because he, he has to say, welcome her in the way worthy of the saints. You might not respect her. You might see a woman coming to you. And I don't care what culture you're in, women have always been lower, right? Even the Western culture in America, less than 100 years ago, right, women had the right to vote. So you might not welcome her as, like, you would welcome a man. So, as an apostle of Jesus Christ, welcome her in a way that's worthy of the saints. Not just that, but when she comes to you, treat her as a disciple of Jesus who's on a mission to do something and help her out. Don't ignore her. That's big. Okay? Application point from that really easy. Do not be afraid to pioneer. I'm, I'm sending some of you guys free right now. Do not be afraid to pioneer to lead ministries in this church. There are, the majority of the serving roles in this church are different than Pastor Stevens' roles. The girl, 99.9% .9 of the roles in this church are not Pastor Stephen's roles. You don't have to be Pastor Stephen. There's tons of roles in this church. Do it. If someone else is not going to take charge of something, like children's ministry, if someone's not going to take charge of, say, Kairos, if someone's not going to take charge of a retreat, if someone's not going to take charge of doing AV or worship, do it. Pioneer, lead it, cast vision, bring people in with you. And here's the reality, right? Because you guys are old enough. You guys are not 10 years old. Some people are going to disrespect you. I'm telling you right now, some people will disrespect you. So what are you going to do? <clears throat> what Paul did is that he commended people. Right? And, and this is why I mean that to, this is why I mean, how I mean to apply that. I think if you're a woman in the church, you've got to know that there are some people who are going to help you. Right? There, are, there are some men who are man enough to help get things done, right? You do have friends, whether they be men or women at the church, or if you run into roadblocks, don't skip up. But believe that the Holy Spirit is working in people to help you in those ministries that you believe in doing. A lot of what being a visionary and a pioneer means is just getting turned down and shot down, and that's a stupid idea, step, you know, step up and do it again. 
Right, that's just the kind of complication that I'm behind. Look at this church, look at the ministries in this church. Right? Understand that as a woman of God, you can see things that men can't see, right? Just because men and women are different, we grow differently. So if there are roles in the church, there are needs in the church that are not being met, do them. And since you guys are older, don't just do them alone. Bring people alongside you. It's going to be hard, some people might reject you, but know that you might have people who are willing to help you. Alright, so look for that. <clears throat> Last part of this verse. For she has been a patron of many, and of myself as well. And this is what's encouraging about this. So not, is, not only is Phoebe a servant, right? not only is she like a go around and do things, right? But apparently she's also a patron. That word patron means she gives money to. That, that's, you know, to me, that's the reality of what missions is like. Because I used to think that like, in missions, you're either a goer or a sender. The reality is you always do a little bit of both. The reality is that sometimes you're on the field, and sometimes you're not on the field. Sometimes like, you're on the field for a little bit, and you get sick, and you come back, spend the rest of the states. Sometimes you stay out there forever, right? But <clears throat> what Paul is saying about Phoebe is that not only is she doing the work of the church, but she's also a patron of Paul and also of the other missionaries with Paul. As a woman, you are what you buy. Right, let me explain what that means. The things you buy define your values, right? For example, <clears throat> why is an LV bag hundreds of dollars? It's canvas. Okay, well, my friend works at LV, he's a manager. He told me this. It's like, we make canvas bags and we sell them for a thousand dollars. It's because people value it, right? People will say, like, this thousand dollars here? I'll be back. Okay, let's trade. Right? It's what you value. So, what did Phoebe value? Phoebe valued the missionary work that Paul was doing and his other apostles were doing, other disciples of Christ were doing. And so she supported that at Rome on I think when you, when you look at that women's magazine and stuff like that, you look at the ads in the women's magazines and you look at the things that they talk about, right? It's, it's kind of funny because I think our culture is like geared toward selling to women. If you go to the mall, like sometimes I always go to the mall with my mom, like if you really want, because it's like no stores for men, right? It's like you look at the directory, it's like all women's building or like women's shoes or like da da da, right? Our culture is geared towards women to buy things. And you, you look at the ads like, be more beautiful, be more like awesome, have better skin, have da da da. You gotta understand that what you spend your money on really does define what you value. And so here's my challenge to you, okay? <clears throat> what Phoebe is known to value is that she values the work of the church. She put her money into the church. She didn't put her money into things that are vain. And trust me, in Roman times, there were a lot of vain things, right? Just like there are today. Her values, which she, her, which she put her money in, show the world what she got. So, three things. <clears throat> Phoebe, commended, a servant of the church. Not as a wife, not as a mother, but as a servant. Paul saying, better. Commend her in a way that is worthy of the saints. This, I guess, for the law of applications, for guys. Encourage women in the church. Okay, 99.9% .9 of the ministries in the church, women are called to do. Yet, the very few men are encouraging towards women in the ministry. And I say that as a person who's gone to seminary, right? I can tell you I'm not very encouraging women in ministry. That's something I want to change. Last one, be a patron. She's a, she was a patron of many and a Paul, too. Where you put your money defines what your values are. That's something you've got to evaluate in your lives. Here we go for men. This is kind of interesting. I had to think about um, the demographic of Kairos. I had to think about like what's ethical to you guys. Because I didn't want to put a preacher, right? Because I put a preacher on here, and you guys were like, oh, see, men are simply loud and like good at speaking and like all this stuff. <clears throat> um, there, was a, there was a preacher in the early, about 1800s, I think. In, yes, 1800s, 1700s. Uh, George Whitfield in America. Legend has it that he could preach to 10,000 without a microphone, with an amplified sound. And Ben Franklin actually is a friend of George Woodfield. And he's like, this is BS. And there's no way you can preach 10,000 without a microphone. And so he was actually um, you know, preaching on the, east, uh, on the East Coast. And the East Coast is a lot of work in this right? And so Ben Franklin was like, all right, this is out. So he rode down the river, right, like two miles from where George Woodfield was, was speaking. And he stood with George Woodfield two miles away down the river. Okay. And, and, he, and he was 
Remember we told one of the like, best pictures I've ever history, his stuff is so written. Um, people were like amazed by his, like, his, his preaching and like his power and all that stuff. Carl Becker's not like that. <laughs> okay, Carl Becker is the opposite of kind of what we would think of as like a superhero missionary. Let me tell you what he used to bring and why I remember him. Medical missionary treated 4,000 leprosy patients. That's 4,000. Okay, I don't know how many patients Ted or Matt sees in like a week, but 4,000 is a lot. <laughs> okay, because he, he didn't just treat leprosy. When he, he served out of the Itori Forest, which is like the Congo, Congo area. And so he was the only resident, yeah, I emphasize that, the only residential medical doctor. Again, I'm not I'm not hospital pro, okay? I don't know how doctors get that stuff at Kaiser, right? But Kaiser served maybe, you know, like that two three block, maybe one mile, two mile radius, right? He served entirely in Aucha, in Turi Forest, and all the surrounding areas because he was a Western practitioner. People liked him. Performed over 3,000 operations and delivered hundreds of babies. But we, re re we remember him as a missionary. So not only did he do all these things as a doctor, but he was also a missionary. <clears throat> this, this is from this book right here. I encourage you guys to get this. All right. Uh, from Jerusalem to Iranjaya, the author is Ruth Tucker. She's a great biographer. This is what Ruth Tucker says of Carl Becker. Becker was not an organizer or a long-range planner, nor was he public relations minded. All right, that's just brutally honest, right? I think a lot of times we suffer with these missionaries and like, you have like no faults and like, you're super awesome. He was not an organizer, he was not a long-range planner, and he was not public relations minded. Here's what that means. Becker, before he became a missionary, he was actually uh, in the States. He was making 10,000 plus a year in the 1900s, early 1900s, so he's rich. And then he was basically serving, and he was like serving the church, and life is good. And then in his life, a mobilizer came about him and said, hey, uh, this woman who was a doctor in the Congo Forest, she died, and uh, we, need, we need another doctor there. And his first response was like, you know, I gotta support my, con my, my family, All right? Like, they helped me out through medical school, and all that stuff, I gotta support my family. I'm making 10,000 a year, I gotta do it up, okay? The mobilizer didn't give up. Kept writing to him. Next winter, he said, okay, it's time for me to go. He gave up making something like 10,000 plus, right, as a salary. And the company made $60 a month. $60 a month. And this is what he, and this is what we talk about by him not an organizer or a long range planner. He built hospitals in the Congo, not by fundraising, but from a salary. With $6 a month, he used his own salary to build hospitals. And so, like, he had like, this little, like, shack hut, right? And then, as it, it had more patients, it's like, all right, how much do I have this month? I have $20 left. All right, so I gotta save five more months, and then we can, like, maybe build another hut. And that's, and that's pretty much what he did. Okay, he was not a good fundraiser. Okay, he was not like some of the awesome patients who are like, all right, guys, right back to the US, like, hey, I need 20 grand, build this hospital. He was like, okay, I have 60 bucks. Okay, I took 10 bucks for food. Okay, and I gotta do this. Okay, 20 bucks left. And I gotta save five months and we build a hospital. This is not how you like start medical missions, I'm telling you right now. But that's what he was. That's what he was as a person. He wasn't qualified in all those ways. Right? He couldn't rally thousands of people to go on missions. What he did do well, 4,000 leprosy patients, 3,000 operations, hundreds of babies delivered. Why do I use him as an example? I know the people in the church, look, the reality is most of you not, guys are not going to be awesome preachers. You're not going to be awesome like church planners and all that stuff. What you are going to be good at in life is you're going to be faithful. If you have faith in God and faith in what God's doing, and you are obedient over time, you will be faithful. This is what that looks like. Carl Becker woke up every day, probably worked 14, 16 hour days, treating people. Leprosy, I'll deal with that, right? Operations I've never seen of, he actually did psychiatry. I don't know what that is, I'll, I'll do it too. Babies need to be delivered, I'll do that too. That's kind of people God honors, okay? I, I want to let you know, it's not just about like doing this awesome thing to make people appreciate how awesome you are. It's about being faithful. It's about believing that God's gonna do something, having faith, being obedient in that direction, and over time, being called faithful. Because if any of that's what it looks like, right? 4,000 legacy patients, 3,000 operations, hundreds of babies delivered. That's what it looks like over time. 
So if you're a guy and you can't you can't lead things and you can't like speak to like spur people on, don't don't do that. You don't have to do that. What I'm saying to you is, if you're gonna run PowerPoint, you run PowerPoint. Right? Don't have people look for you to run PowerPoint. Right? If you're gonna do carpool, do carpool. Take it seriously. Organize spreadsheet, do carpool. Right? If you're gonna disciple two people a week, do disciple. Don't always call them sick or like, oh, like, I was busy at work, da, da, da. Be faithful. Because at the end of your life, every single day of your life determines how you are faithful long term. Or how you're negligent long term. Right? You guys are all 20s and 30s, right? <clears throat> Who you are at 50 starts now. By 50, how many people did you disciple? How many times did you miss discipleship? Let me ask that. By the time you're 50, how many times did someone call you to lead worship and you just, oh, I can't do it, I'm busy. I'm gonna watch something on TV. How many times did you just need a flyer and then you're like, oh, I don't want a flyer, I want to grab lunch. When most men that you're called to do is be a guy like Paul Becker. Wake up every day, work hard. You don't have to speak well, you don't have to lead things, you don't have to be a super awesome visionary, you just have to work hard. You have that faith that God's gonna do something, be obedient in that direction, and over time you'll be faithful. He's an evangelist, but not slick. And I, and I love evangelists who are not slick, okay? Because this is the way he did. He was, he, was, um, he was a missionary, right? So he's like, I can't just do medicine, I'll be can't try to do something else. So people in Congo are illiterate. Right? I mean, when you're, when you're in the jungle, you don't read a lot of books. And so what he did to explain the gospel is he basically just he probably just stick figures. He probably was like, okay, this is Jesus, this is a little T for the cross. <laughs> Alright, this is a little cave, a little dark, and it's a cave. Alright, and he, he, he basically threw the gospel. And he was an artist, he was a doctor, right? You can say doctor is like, you can write, it's terrible. So <laughs> imagine his jaws are even worse. But his crude drawings were done up on a mineograph and were used to show the gospel because many were literate. And that, that's a, that's a mineo, mineograph that you're seeing there. All right, and the, and the way that works is you basically create a stencil. All right, you create like a really durable stencil and you put ink in it and then you press things. It's like, it's like a typewriter for drawings. So imagine this guy, he's not an artist, okay? He basically just drew like sticks like in the dirt and then he put it on a stencil. And stencils are expensive, okay? So he goes to like a mineograph where it's like, hey, can you graph this? And like, it just, it sucks, right? Like, I, Ruth Tucker and other biographers say, if it sucks, it sucks, it's crude. <clears throat> but he used his drawings to show the gospel. At one point in his life, the, the, the story was, was, uh, was uh, shared about him. He was kind of evangelizing, and he saw a soldier, a Congolese soldier. And he said, what are you, what are you using? And the soldier, he didn't even know a soldier before. He showed him what he was using, and it was his drawings. So not only did he use his drawings himself, but the people around him, his, his African staff, started to use his drawings, and they, they showed the gospel throughout, throughout the Congo area. Not split. All right, he was a publisher, he didn't have, he, I mean, if it was me, right, I'd do, just call up America, because I can't be an artist. Not a smart guy, he just like, all right, stick figures, let's ink this out. That's it. That's what faithful looks like. Sometimes it's not, it's not a super awful story. Right, I guarantee you, if, you know, Colbeck came to this church and showed his drawings, you'd be like, what is that? It's disgusting. <laughs> All right, like, you really can spend five minutes learning how to draw and to do this better. That's what he was. The reality is, the majority of people who serve in the church, you're not going to be recognized as super awesome. Okay? I'm telling you that. Very few of you are going to do something, and people are going to come up to you and be like, I'm so inspired by the way you do AD. Okay? That's, that's, that's the reality of life. No one's coming to you and be like, I'm inspired by the way you did carpool. That was amazing. I got there, and I knew how hard it was, so thank you so much for carpool. That's not going to happen. The majority of you are going to serve in a way that, you know, you never came to this. You just do it because you want to serve the church. But God sees that. And over time, you must do it. A lot of times with being a man is, it's just, it's not about being some kind of super alpha male. Alright, it's about drawing some really crude stick figures, okay, and showing it off. This is what it said about um, Cole Becker after he died. Quote from Mental Training by Becker. Many missionaries have preached Jesus Christ to me, and many missionaries had taught Jesus Christ to me, but in Becker I have seen Jesus Christ. When I read that, I was, I was floored. 
Many missionaries have preached Jesus Christ to me. Many missionaries have taught Jesus Christ to me. But in Becker, I have seen him. Right, I have seen Jesus Christ. Carl Becker, I doubt I can find any of his writings. Right? I could doubt, I would doubt I would find any churches who would like reprint his some of the sermons or even use the stick figure drawings. But this is an African, this is not American. This is one of the persons that he trained in the hospital. I have seen Jesus Christ. Man, that, that means that means so much more than inspiring someone for like an hour by speaking. That means so much more than like, wow, you build an amazing church. For a person to say, I have seen the glory of God in the way he lived. That's what a man is supposed to be. Okay? That's what a man is supposed to be. We're supposed to show people Jesus Christ in our actions. And if that's the case, then, all right, I want to I want to liberate this thought, okay? Especially most of us are single. It's not about being a husband. It's not about being a pastor. It's not about being a father. It's about being a person who follows Jesus Christ. It's about being a person who, when they make decisions, they have the kingdom of God in mind. That's what being a man means. Is that when you make decisions in your life, have the kingdom of God, have the gospel in mind. That's not affect the way you lead. That's not way, affect the way you set example for others. That's not affect the way you preach or you teach or whatever. But if you live your life in a way to show people Jesus Christ, then you succeed in being a man. And I think, and I think the way you do that, okay, is again, it's being, it's being faithful. Sum it up. We're going to break into small groups in a second. We got one to talk about in small groups. Um, it might, might be much gender, it might be single gender, but anyways. I want women to, kind of, women to kind of think about, maybe just be honest and be like, what are some of the ministries that you've been discouraged from doing? Mm-hmm. Okay, maybe we're supposed to start there as women. But also, what are the, some of the ministries that you're passionate about, right, and that you want to do more? Okay, and I think in a small group, maybe we can encourage other for women. And then for men, let's talk about what are some of the things that we can support the church in doing, all right? What are some things that the church doesn't have people to do? I know carpool is one big one. I'm not bringing up so much. All right. Because no one wants to carpool. And with that, let us pray. <coughs> Father God, I thank you for this chance to study your word. I thank you for this chance to examine lives in history. Um, God, I pray that you would use the men and women in this church in a way that changed the world. That changed the world because of, let the world see your glory. Let the world see Jesus Christ. Let the world world know that you are real by both our words and our actions. Lord, bless this time of small groups. Um, Maybe a time where we can just be honest and open with each other to share hurts and pains and joys. Um, And may we just be thankful, Lord, for the gospel, for you saving us, for giving us new life, and for giving us the Holy Spirit that we can go forth from this place and be strengthened for ministry, strengthened because our cause is the kingdom of God that is everlasting. May you bless this time. May you use it to your glory. Jesus, name, pray.